One hunter stranded alone. I gave myself a 5% chance of survival. In the brutal Alaskan wilderness. There's animals that want to eat you. There's weather that's going to kill you. Battling a relentless storm without any shelter. The whole sky was black. Stalked by predators. If you can't get back in that tree, you're dead. His dogged determination and steadfast faith are his only survival weapons. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Ah! Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Hi, I'm Craig DiMartino. This is one of Alaska's most remote areas. It was here on a hunting trip that Adrian Knops' friend, Garrett Hagen, disappeared. Now, alone on a marshy delta much like this one, Adrian is both physically and emotionally drained. But he doesn't want to die here. There is plenty that can kill a man out in the remote wilderness of Alaska. Grizzlies, wolves, swift river currents, frigid waters, and extreme weather. 51-year-old Adrian Knops was unfortunately all too familiar with the list. Just today, the third day into a hunting trip with his best friend, Adrian knew something terrible had happened to Garrett Hagen. That's fair. See in a bit. Garrett had motored out to his fishing boat, the Abundance. It was anchored about a half mile away in the mouth of the Chickaman River. As Garrett neared the vessel, in the blink of an eye, he disappeared. After about an hour, I just knew that he was gone. The boat was just there, anchored in the water, dead in the water. Adrian's and Garrett's families didn't expect the two seasoned outdoorsmen home for another week. So nobody would come looking for them for at least seven more days. If I died and the tide swept me away, I knew that the families, Garrett's and mine, would think we were killed by wolves, bears. Adrian's deep concern for the families, for his own wife, two sons, and granddaughter back in Michigan, and for Garrett's family in Craig, Alaska, strengthened his will to survive. I cannot let these people think that that's what happened to us. I knew I had to get through that to tell the story. His first goal was to get off that mudflat. Adrian knew that in the Misty Fjords area of southeast Alaska, the icy tides rush in. He needed to find higher ground or he'd drown. The mudflat was bordered by steep vertical cliffs on one side and the Chickaman River on the other. A narrow tree line edged along the base of the cliffs. It's only about 20 yards of trees before it goes straight vertical cliff walls. The tree line was full of wolf and bear tracks. So the tree line was off limits, and the river on the other side was too wide, too swift, and too cold to swim across. He was stuck on that long, wide mudflat. His only option was a fallen tree. I would just use the root base of the tree as a windbreak. The bad part is when the tides came in after that first night, they came in high. And every night, they got higher and higher. The tree trunk provided a solid windbreak and Adrian was able to build a small fire. But the tides kept growing, getting deeper and deeper around the tree. My dry spot became wet underwater. It came in so fast, it just picked the fire, it was gone. Adrian took Craig DiMartino back to that fallen tree that gave him sanctuary from the fast rising water. There was my perch right there. So you get up here and there's a little place to stick half your butt and one shoulder into. But when the winds are really strong, see the wind, like even now in the breeze, it's coming through here like a funnel. Right. Hits me right in the side of the head. So you bunch up down like this and like this and you just sit. Rain continued into the next day, but the storm that had soaked the fire came with one silver lining. There was a pocket in the tree, just a little bowl. I 
couldn't get my hands or face in it, but I could cut a piece of dried marsh grass. I used it as a straw, and I drank out of that, the rainwater. When the low tide was out, I figured I needed to get some real water, so I hiked over to the mountains to the south. Off the rock walls with the rain, I mean, there's just cascades of fresh water. So I would just stay there for about a half an hour, and I would drink until I couldn't drink anymore. And then I'd walk back before the tide came in. Adrian ventured to the tree line during the short couple of hours during low tide, and only in daylight. Nighttime in those trees was far too dangerous. Every morning when I was there, I would look. You'd always see the wolf tracks. And when you get out into the sand, there is a pretty major bear trail. I figured, you know, this is covered by tide. Twice a day, I'm seeing these tracks. I cannot come to the trees for shelter. The day he and Garrett had come ashore, Adrian had brought with him four small snack bars. He still had those, and he still had Garrett's two hunting rifles. I thought about hunting for food, but without a fire, I asked myself, are you ready to eat whatever you shoot raw? And I'm like, no. In case a passing aircraft happened to fly by, Adrian prepared a hasty signal. I would go down at low tide, and I went way out to the end, and I wrote an SOS. And then I drew a big arrow, and then walked up the sand maybe 100 yards, and then I drew another big sign, help, <laughs> another big arrow. So if a plane's flying there, they would fly right along the arrows, and I'd be standing at the end of them. For now, the giant tree provided safety from the life-threatening tides. I was basically trapped up on that perch. But less and less respite from the worsening weather. Stuck out in the open, he braced himself as a black sky crept across the horizon. Big black billowing clouds were just coming in over the mountains across the channel. Wow, that's a big storm. <laughs> And then it started to lightning. Electrical storms are rare for Alaska. Boom, boom, boom. Wow, that's pretty. But at the same time, you knew it was headed your way. And I'm standing in the middle of a, a, a tidal flat of a river. Exposed, nowhere to hide, Adrian was a perfect target for a lightning strike. I had a thought that I may not, may not get out of there. Perched on a fallen tree in the middle of a remote Alaskan saltwater mudflat, Adrian Knops was literally hanging on for his life. Adrian wasn't sure he'd make it through the first night, much less the second or the third nights, as a drenching rain plagued him day after day, but he held on. The tides crept higher and higher with each cycle. The storm grew and pounded the mudflat with rain, obliterating Adrian's handmade SOS. And on Thursday... It was like there was a wall, and it was five mile an hour wind turned into a 70 mile an hour wind, like that. Whoa, you know, your clothes are just fluttering back. I was semi-hypothermic. I was like, man, I, I may not get out of here. But Adrian was driven by his desire to live and to be able to tell his family, and especially Garrett's, what had happened to him. My whole personal focus out here, and that's why this area doesn't bother me. It's, it wasn't about me. Th this whole area wasn't about me. I was, I was surviving for my wife and granddaughter and kids to make sure that the families knew the right story and make sure that if I died right here, God would look at me and be happy. So in the middle of the vicious storm, thinking Thursday night might be his last, Adrian worked out a way to leave behind a record of their ordeal. 
I took one of Garrett's guns, and I took my hunting knife. I proceeded to carve a message into the gun. In essence, it said that Garrett was from Craig, Alaska, and he died on September 15th, 2013, taking his big bear to the boat. I thought that would give him the story of what happened of our hunt and how he died. And then I said, Adrian Knopf's stuck on tidal flat, cold, wet, no food. I had it high up so that people searching a rescue, passing boaters, maybe would see this gun, even if it's three years from now. It was like I put a message in a bottle and threw it into the river, you know, and it's just, there's hope right there. Friday came. I guess I can take more than I think I can. And that gives you a resolve to keep going on more. And then about the same time in the afternoon, boom, that wind came back. The storm returned with a vengeance, as if focusing all its deadly energy directly at the withered tree and the battered hunter. I thought the winds the previous two days were bad. Wow. Every time I turned around, especially with the storm, it just got worse. If the previous winds were 75, these were 100 plus winds. It forces you up on top of that tree. When I got up there, it almost blew me off. I knew I couldn't fall off in the water because by that time of the week, the tide was up about five feet around that tree. That was a tough afternoon. For Adrian Knops, the last six days had been extremely tough. He started the week with four snack bars. He ate the last one two days ago. The only fresh water to drink was whatever settled in the nooks and crannies of the tree trunk. Any energy he had left, he spent clinging to that tree. But by the last night, I could tell I was getting weaker. I was so sleep deprived. I mean, at that point, it was six days with three hours of sleep. Throughout his ordeal, two things had brought Adrian comfort. Oh, please, Jehovah, I know that you are looking on. A Jehovah's Witness, Adrian began praying on day one. The prayer was more of an ongoing narrative, spoken out loud, feeling God was right there at his side helping him out. His other solace came whenever he looked out towards the mouth of the river and saw the abundance. Seeing Garrett's fishing boat still firmly anchored gave him hope. So you had a clear shot at the abundance. Were you just looking just to look at it, to see it? You know, the Coast Guard's bound to come once we're reported missing. I figured if they saw the boat, I mean, the natural thing is follow the river up. Saturday evening, the rain let up and the storm cleared just briefly, but long enough to deal Adrian one more cruel, demoralizing blow. But when it stopped right before dark, the boat was gone. I was like, oh no. You know, the, the starting point of the search has just drifted away. The violent storm had broken the abundance off its anchor and sent it out to sea with the current. The wilderness, it seemed, was going to win in Adrian's week-long fight to survive. What would be when you felt like, I'm at the bottom, this is it? It'd have to be Sunday morning. I was ready to, to collapse. Right. <laughs> I, I'm sure looking back, it was sleep deprivation, you know, a whole week with only a few hours of sleep. And that's when I said, uh, I may not make it back up on top of this tree. I just, I just laid down. I didn't have that uh, drive to stand anymore. I just had to get some rest. Because the pain was so intense at the, at the time. Knives in your joints and the hips. And I was like, you know, this is probably your last morning. The tides will come in midday. If you can't get back in that tree, you're dead. Adrian Knops has been stranded in the wilderness of Alaska for a week. And now, he has reached his end. And you decide to just lay down. Yeah, I just, I just laid down in the wet grass. Like you're not gonna get back up, like this uh, is the I, end. I, I knew there was a chance. Jehovah, thank you for the life that I have had. I said my last goodbyes to my family when I was laying down. 
said my last prayers and thank God for all he'd done. Thank you for the goodness that you have shown. In the pre-dawn hours of Sunday, September 22nd, a Coast Guard helicopter crew based in Sitka, Alaska, took off for the Misty Fjords wilderness. A cruise ship had just reported finding an abandoned vessel adrift in that area. It was the abundance. Well, it's the dreaded call that every fisherman family in the world dreads. A call from the Coast Guard saying the boat was found adrift with nobody on board. The four-man crew of the Coast Guard MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter didn't have a precise location to initiate a search. But Coast Guard Lieutenant Chris Enixon had a hunch. Looking at the landscape, I looked at Chickaman River. That was the first spot that would offer somebody that was going hunting a location to put ashore in a good valley to hunt. The aircraft flew low, below 300 feet, to give the rescue crewmen a better chance of spotting someone. During our search patterns, we saw packs of wolves, brown bear tracks. So there's definitely wildlife out there that could pose a threat to someone that would be out there in that situation. Out on the wet mud flat, a weak, exhausted Adrian Canops had passed out after having endured a long night in an unforgiving storm. I said my last prayer. That's the last thing I remember. What's your next memory? The noise of a helicopter right there, over the top of that river. There's a Coast Guard helicopter. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and it's got its tail pointed to me. So they and there's can't no see. windows in the back. They can't see. And they can't see me. After a long week of much prayer, Adrian had one more message for God to hear. I could tell they were leaving. I said, now's your opportunity. Just turn your head. Just make him turn his head. Just the pilots were calling out that we were going to move on to our next search area. I just kind of happened to turn my head uh, over my, my left shoulder one last time. Just happened to see something that didn't seem natural. I realized that, oh, that's not a tree, that's a survivor. All of a sudden, that chopper just stops on a dime. Oh. <laughs> Door flings open. And I stepped out of the aircraft and walked over to Adrian. He had uh, told me that he had been sitting there for seven days waiting for help. All right, well, uh, we're here to get you out of here. It's policy that rescue crewmen only retrieve the survivor and not any gear. But Adrian wasn't going to leave behind the rifles, especially not the one that he had carved with the story of Garrett's terrible fate. He started walking me to the helicopter and I said, we got to take these guns. And I said, Garrett's family would want the gun with the message on it. I wanted the gun with the message on it. So they saw it and they unloaded them and brought them with. As soon as David said he was ready to go, we picked up, got max power and beat feet. David was quite concerned with how cold he was. So we wanted to get Adrian to the hospital as quick as possible. It's the most fantastic helicopter ride I've ever had. They got me to catch camp probably at 15 minutes. Got me to the hospital and everything went well. Seven days in the elements is unheard of. Uh, and the fact that he was able to survive that long with minimal water and minimal food and, and no shelter is truly a miracle. You know, his attitude and positive mental state is, is the main contributor as to why he survived. He had a reason to survive, he had a will to survive, and he held on. If you would have asked me during the week, what are your two biggest enemies? Hands down, I would have said wind, and I would have said rain. Made existence miserable. And yet without the rain, where there would I have gotten fresh water to drink in the, in the quantities that I did? Even the forceful winds that tore the abundance from its anchor and set it adrift to be spotted by passing ships took on a new meaning. Without that, the family wouldn't have missed us until Sunday. The Coast Guard would have waited to see if we're just late. They would have searched till Monday or Tuesday. 
In the state I was in, I probably wouldn't be alive today. Once again, that enemy of the wind proved to be salvation there. After two nights in the hospital, Adrian went directly to Garrett's parents. I'm so sorry about Garrett. He returned Garrett's rifle, bearing his indelible account of their son's last moments. Garrett Hagen, Craig Alaska, died taking a big bear to the boat. I looked at the gun. I did what I thought I'd do. Oh, man. I just broke down and started crying. It was very, very emotional. Thank you. I'm glad you made it. Four days after Adrian was rescued, the Coast Guard located the drowned body of Garrett Hagen, nearly 30 miles from where his boat had been anchored. We're a very close family. And I was grieving, you know, my heart was broken. But I lost my boy, but I wasn't angry. Just recently, the photos were found on a camera that Garrett had on his person. Garrett was always a happy guy. He, he was in his element that day. The water, the mountains, he loved it. Those will be treasured photos forever for me. Adrian's survival didn't hinge on one thing in particular. His ongoing dialogue with God kept his mind off just how dire his circumstances really were. He used his survival skills and knowledge of wilderness to keep himself alive. But it was his faith and focus on family that fueled Adrian's epic fight to survive. <laughs>